Have you ever wondered how your sales performance compares against your competitors and peers? The B2B Sales Benchmark Report provides the definitive guide to what success looks like in 2021. See how you compare in terms of win rate, sales cycle, average deal value, relationships, and engagement. You can see the results and get the full report at ebster.com forward slash B2B dash sales dash benchmarks. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales operations onto the show to deconstruct the why, what, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by Ebster, the leading customer engagement platform for Salesforce. Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today we're joined by James Hayes. Now, James, I think we're looking at around seven years experience uh, in sales ops right now, currently VP yeah. of RevOps at Business Solver. So we're going to jump into that specifically, actually to talk about running remote teams, remote sales teams more specifically. James, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And I want to first actually understand your transition into sales ops, uh, because yeah, I, I believe when you moved in, you, you weren't uh, pushed into a, a revenue operations role. I um, mean, you came from a slightly different role into sales ops and then into rev ops. So I just want to understand that journey. If you, if you'd be kind enough to share how that, yeah. how that happened. Yeah. So, I mean, if I, if I go back all the way, I mean, as various analytical roles, um, working for a, a large bank, um, and I, I kind of transitioned it into sales operations after that, because I kept, uh, um, wanting to do more, but, but kind of just being, um, in that industry, it, it just wasn't working for me. So I transitioned, uh, um, to a, uh, like a kind of a pre IPO, um, startup company, uh, and kind of, um, led their, uh, sales operations, or at least, um, a small team there. Uh, and the transition from sales operations to revenue operations didn't actually happen until, um, a few years after that. And, that came about because uh, uh, the need to actually start looking at all revenue sources um, and also additional products um, that were going to be released um, and additional teams that were adding on. Uh, and there just wasn't any processes in place for those different segments. So the transition was kind of just morphed into that. Like, hey, sales operations, great. And, and it still is a fundamental part of, of what I do. Um, but getting into the revenue operations was kind of a necessity to then um, harness the rest of the business. Got it. So they were, they were seeing what a great job you were doing with the sales team. And they were like, we need to get James to do more. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now focusing on Business Solver, could you just roughly take us through the current tech stack? Yeah, so... Um, I had like a, uh, um, a good relationship with our, our marketing operations team. So I'll include some of their stuff, but, uh, for the sales side, we, we use Salesforce for our CRM. Um, our marketing platform is HubSpot. Uh, those are directly linked. Uh, they speak back and forth. Uh, we also use zoom info powered by discover.org, uh, which is integrated our system. Uh, we use my edge, which is kind of a, a platform that pulls in 5,500 data, um, since we're, we deal with uh, healthcare, uh, we also have um, Sales Loft, which is for obvious reasons to help our, our Salesforce uh, team. And we have a few others that we kind of bake in on the back end to help support that. Um, but those are really our, our main ones. Got it. And then, roughly, how many people in the RevOps team and how many reps, both service and sales, are you supporting? Oh man, we support. Um, so on the RevOps team, uh, there's now eight. 
And uh, we also have our leader, which is also responsible for uh, the BDR team um, and a few other areas um, that are there. Uh, and then the sales force, man, it, it's, it's grown quite a bit, but uh, we support three different segments within our, within our core. And there's probably about 20 individuals on that team. And then we have three other segments outside of that, um, probably with another, I want to say 20 or so there. So we're looking at a team of around 40 to 45, depending on if you include leaders um, and, and cross-functionality or cross-functions. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now, what I think is super interesting is you mentioned at the start of this call that you guys were primarily remote even before March of this year. Um, could you share more about how you think your job as a revenue off leader changes with the remote team and in person team? I, I assume you've worked with in person or in house teams or in person teams before. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when I said uh, mostly remote, it's mostly our sales uh, org that's remote. And then we had a few people on the operations side as remote. I, I actually enjoy going into the office um, quite a bit. I think uh, how it's impacted um, the way that our team functions is mainly around projects and collaboration. Uh, we actually have to fit um, time on our calendars to specifically collaborate on certain things, whereas, whereas before um, you could walk over to somebody's office or desk. Um, and kind of discuss it face to face. So it's been sort of an issue trying to figure that out. Um, Not to mention when you had quick questions, things of that nature, if you're in the same building, it was really easy to do that. So um, I I find the team being um, adjusting to actually setting time on the calendar, not to specifically have a meeting, but to collaborate on on certain projects. And I think that's kind of been extremely beneficial um, for us. Makes sense. Now, Rep productivity, can you share an example of something that you have done at Business Solver that has boosted rep productivity significantly? Yeah, so um, productivity, I kind of look at it as uh, um, more about efficiency and spending the dollars and the time in the, in the, right, in the right spots. And so what we use is we like to score everything in our, in our CRM. Um, so what we do is we put a, a fire score, essentially a fit, um, intent, recency, and engagement score on just about all the leads. And then we roll all those things up to the account. So what we do is we say, hey, as a consultant, if your territory has roughly 200 accounts in it, um, we know that 50 of those accounts are extremely engaged. Uh, they, they're a good fit from us from a front graphic standpoint. Um, they have uh, an intent that they want to maybe buy from us. Um, they've been on our website, which is the recency several times in the last few uh, weeks. Um, and they're engaged with our marketing content. And so what we do is we have our consult that's updated uh, real time uh, to their dashboard. And they simply open that up in the beginning of the day. And they, they run through those accounts first thing um, every day, at least we try to coach them on to, to doing that um, because we did do some tests on that score uh, a lot. And we found, um, I think we tested on 10 accounts per, per consultant uh, and they were holding between eight uh, meeting, eight, nine meetings out of those 10 accounts. So it was really effective for us. Um, so we've continued that uh, going forward. Got it. And how are you, where are you, are you getting the data from in order to, to create that score on the, on each? Record. Yeah. So we get most of our data from, from custom coding that we do um, in the background from the two systems of HubSpot and Salesforce. Um, so what we do is we attach those instances together and we score the traffic coming in uh, based on IP addresses or their domain. Uh, we also use a technology called um, Bombora, uh, which gives us a lot of the intent data because I, they aggregate um, search data through Google. Uh, and we pull that in based on the keywords that we um, we think our customers are searching for software like ours. So we score them a little bit differently. Uh, and then we use, uh, my edge and a few other texts to match up those domains for brokers, carriers, other channel partners, um, to give them a score that way as well. Awesome. Now, since the virus hit is like, as we know, we, we haven't shifted remote or, or non-remote. Has anything else changed and have you had to adapt in any other way? Oh yeah, of course. So, I mean, we had to do a complete pipe pipeline scrub 
to go through to see what um, what deals were were impacted by COVID. Uh, so what we did is we had our consultants go out to their current pipeline as well as anybody they were having meetings with, and just directly ask them if it, it's going to impact. Uh, and they came, we made a special um, field within Salesforce to, for them to mark, and it came back and we ran our next um, analysis on where we thought we were going to hit. Um, we had to make uh, some adjustments on that number because it did impact our pipeline as well as uh, those that were in late stages uh, within our pipeline. They actually had to back off a little bit. So we're hoping to, to keep them engaged through some marketing content and hopefully when they come back around next year, because usually it's on an annual to three to five year contracts, um, we'll catch them then. Got it. So we may have to push pipeline back a little bit. Um, so that's gonna, that will have impacted the forecast. Oh, dramatic. Yeah. Intensely, yep. Got it. Have you started to see in, in more, more recent weeks those deals coming back in or is it, it, it still relatively yeah. uncertain? So um, mainly in the government space because their budget was kind of already set up. Uh, a lot of those deals maybe got on hold for just a little bit, but then they came back around because the budget was set at the beginning of the year. So they already had budget set aside for it. Um, and that's kind of how those those government deals work. Um, as far as the private sector, uh, we've seen a few come back around, uh, mainly because they were thinking about making judgment calls on staff and things of that nature, and they just didn't have the numbers in check because we get paid on per employee per month um, that's in our system. So if they came in with 4,000 people on their system, but then thought they were going to reduce their staff 20 to 30 percent, they were trying to get those numbers in line or to get then different pricing from us um, on the back end. So we have seen those ones, but then there's other ones that, that flat out said, we don't know how this is going to impact us. And we don't want to impact our staff by making a fast change um, or a dramatic change uh, this year. So maybe we'll look at it next year. Got it. And were there any other changes you, you had to make it in response to the virus? Any other changes that I would make in response to the virus? Uh, that, that you had to make that, 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 over the past few months? Oh, yeah. Uh, not really. I mean, most of the time, the like I said, we're working remote. Uh, we have done a few more analysis on the, the impact of COVID coming in. Uh, we've made um, adjustments to some of our marketing material um, for obvious reasons. We've also made a little uh, change within our sales process to include a lot of those questions around discovery to get a little bit more in discovery mode, um, to understand what their business looks like, what they think their business is going to look like in six months compared to nine months, um, because we're always looking for those customers that we think are going to grow. Um, and, you know, uh, sometimes these companies, they don't know. Uh, but when we ask about COVID, a lot of them say, you know, we may be reducing staff if X, Y, and Z does not happen within the next few months. And that's just really good for us to know so we know how to better support them. Got it. Makes sense. Um, now onto the forecasting process. What is your current process? How does that work and who is involved? Yeah, I love forecasting. So forecasting is only as good as the people who put the data in the, the system. So we do a, a couple... Yeah, we do a couple of ways to do it. So we have one on the back end that we um, analyze the data using a scoring methodology, like we score everything on how far the, the deals are going down the pipeline, how much time in between each stage, um, who's on the deal from a contact standpoint, how engaged are they? All that stuff goes into kind of in the background. Um, but as far as how it's run, we have our, what we call segment sales operations managers. Um, we have the sales managers and then we have kind of finance um, that's in there. And we usually do um, bi-weekly calls, but we kind of push it out to monthly because things are moving a little bit slower uh, recently. So what they do is they get on the line after the sales manager has set their forecast within our sales force. It's pretty standard. You have your commit, you have your upside, you have your pipeline there. Um, and we try to project out for the next quarter. Uh, so we say, we go through where you're at this quarter and then what you project to next quarter and then if we have time, we'll go into uh, what we can provide the following quarter that we may be able to pull into this quarter to um, help out if they're behind on deals. Uh, we also go through um, sort of uh, if they've given us some type of commit number, we kind of push on that number a little bit to say, okay, well, based on what we see um, in the pipeline, nothing has moved. And that's where I say it's about as good as the data they put in it, right? So that's where we get a lot of our context. 
What makes ours a little bit different though than I feel other companies is that the segment sales operations leader on our team have had experience in sales and they also work some of those deals that these guys are forecasting on or have. Um, and by that from usually from a technical standpoint, so they can generally call out um, some erroneous data very quickly, um, which helps us quite a bit on our, on our uh, forecasting process. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Having the people involved actually understand selling. Um, oh, yeah. Broader question now. What do you think has been the, the sales metric or KPI that's added the most value to your career in sales operations? Sort of get real. I think it KPIs change wherever you go. What I did um, here and, and previously is I just ran as many figures as I possibly could through the system or analyzed as many of them as I possibly could to figure out what was actually making sense. Um, here, I settled on a couple layers. So um, from a marketing standpoint, we set up seven milestones and these milestones are point in time um, that puts a marketing engagement score on them. And we score our consultants by that because what that does is if they're working their territory, their marketing engagement score should go up. So month over month, we follow that score and that trend line. And as long as it's making an upward uh, trend across their entire territory, it's usually a pretty good sign. But then when you get down um, to the basics, I mean, you have your quota achievement, you have your meeting set and things of that nature, which I think everybody pretty much tracks. Um, but our consultants are scored. They have a score um, from zero to 10. And that score rolls up all their basic activity, all their current pipeline, um, how far it is in the stages, how many times they've um, missed closed dates, things of that nature. It's all rolled up. Like I said, I love scores because what that does is it rolls up to our reporting and we have it set up to then notify myself and the managers if a score drops behold below a certain threshold interesting that's we've i've never heard anyone do something like this we like obviously we hear a lot of companies scoring leads customers but never having this combined score for consultants or reps um and then using that to assess performance and flag alerts that is super super interesting yeah um, yeah I, I i love talking about it because it is a beast of uh um of a salesforce achievement because we we build it in Excel first, and then we build it in um, Salesforce. Got it. Um, and a final question, who is the person in sales ops or rev ops that you would most like to take for lunch? You know, there's several in my life. I mean, a lot of it I learned from Sales Benchmark Index, um, but I'd say get me started was probably a fellow named uh, Jeff Coleman, which was at a previous employment um, and then now recently, I'd say I have Matt Knoll, um, as well as Dave Moore, Dave Moore from a standpoint of just always keep him motivated, always looking for something that, uh, gets thrown forward and Matt, um, uh, basically around process and, and kind of sticking to the guns and, and moving forward with, uh, rev and sales operations. Got it. Got it. James, I want any, uh, sales ops person or rev ops person listening to, Consider also scoring reps, looking at rep activity, and then rolling up things they do well or, or maybe not so well into a score. Because I think that's the first time out of 108 interviews, I believe, that we've heard that. James, you want to add something? Yeah, one last thing that's, that's benefit from us. And if, if they want to check it out, feel free to reach mm. out to me. But uh, um, it also tells us those consultants who maybe are planning on leaving with right now at almost wow. 100% accuracy. So it also um, gives us that instance, and, you'll, and I can explain that a little bit further if we had more time. But uh, yeah, it's another benefit because you want to get out ahead of that. So you can either A, talk to them, see what's going on, because usually you have some type of uh, issue maybe, um, or they just, they're just looking for another path, and you can get on recruiting way earlier, saving you both time and money. I mean, I, I, I'm going to open the floor for another 30 to 60 seconds if you could just shine a little bit more light if you're happy to james on yeah, yeah. Um, on on how you do that well what are the things you're looking at yeah so we use a program called redshift which is basically just a giant database but it houses all the data that's coming in from our systems uh, and we check login information um, emails sent from the server 
um, Salesforce information and it scores them by engagement. And we look at the blips in how often they're doing certain things and they're, most of them will stay perfectly steady. But once we see a dip, our last questions, are you on vacation? Um, you know, something going on. Um, if none of those hit, I watch it for the next um, week. And then generally, if it dips down again, we actually ask the question and nine times out of 10, they'll, they'll come straight forward and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I got another job. <laughs> got it. Uh, there we have it, James. Super fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been yeah. an absolute pleasure having you here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Tom. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest, or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com.